You know, God has a purpose for every one of his lighthouses. Every one of them. He's got a sovereign purpose for them. Just as long as we do our job, he's faithful. What is this for Children's Church at this time? Keith and Melissa have Children's Church this morning. Everyone else, please turn your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke. Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, by Maddie. Luke, chapter 16. Will be the text this morning. As you're finding that passage, I'll share with you a little bit of reality in the world today. The reality is and has been since the fall of man that there is a great gulf between the rich in this world and the poor in this world. A great gulf, a gap, a separation, if you will. And that's true today, not only in America, but throughout the world. That gap exists. However, we note that in the Scriptures, God wants that gap or that separation to close. Correct? He wants it to close. As Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, as followers of all 66 books in the Bible, how can we close that gap? Is it possible? Some Christians would say, well, I believe the only way to close that huge gap between the rich and the poor, the haves and the have-nots, is through capitalism. You see, capitalism, that system works. If we can just bring up the ones who do not have and give them jobs, trickle down economics, then they can begin working and improving their lives and it will close the gap. And some say capitalism is the best way to close that gap. Does it work? I think history has proven by and large capitalism has a lot of faults. You know why? Because of two human vices, greed and corruption. Greed and corruption. Because people are by nature, because of the fall of Adam and Eve, greedy and corrupted. Capitalism has a lot of problems. I read just this morning, I was doing a little bit of research, that the CEO of Kroger, corporation where my daughter works part-time, makes in 2016 $11.7 million a year. He's probably got a cost of living raise since then, so let's round it up to $12 million a year. And I did a little bit of math, and I'm not real good at math, but I think I did this correctly. That averages out on average 40-hour work week to be like $6,000 an hour. And if you round that down to 60 minutes in an hour, that's basically $100 a minute. That means that he would make more in five minutes than what most of his workers might wait, make in a week. And you all have heard the stories, of course, about how CEOs who run their companies into the ground leave with some 50 to $210 million severance packages. I don't get that. Do you? I'm confused. If some of you can understand that, I, I know there's shareholders in the stock market, and I, I get all that, and you just can't fire a CEO. You just got to send them off with a severance pack. In 2007, the CEO of Home Depot left with a $210 million severance package. I think he got $20 million in cash. Probably needed to pay a few bills. The rest was in stock. I don't get that. But that is a weakness in capitalism. But that's the way the system works. Now, like me, most of you, most of you adhere to capitalism. We would admit it's not perfect. It's not perfect because of greed and corruption, but it's the best way. 
think we'd agree with that, but it's not perfect. It's not the solution to continue to close that gap. Others would say, well, socialism, that's the answer. Socialism. Let's take the salaries of these CEOs and the billionaires out there and let the government take all that money from them and redistribute it to everybody. And some say that's the best way to close the gap. That's the only way to close the gap. Let's adhere to the system of socialism in the United States because it will work and, and it will bring the haves and the have-nots closer together and close that gap. The only problem with that is the teachings of Karl Marx has been tried for the last century, in the 20th century, largely, largely testifying what? It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Some refer to it, of course, as communism. It doesn't work. You know why? Same two reasons. Greed and corruption. Because who's in charge of the government? People. Because of the fallenness of man, greed and corruption, socialism doesn't work either. It looks good on paper, but in reality it falls apart. So, as Christians, is there a third option? Yeah, there is. And I think it's one that many of us, including myself, oftentimes want to go back to. The third option in closing that gap is just indifference. It's just indifference. We look at it and we say, well, you know, I'm not an expert in business. This is all too much for me, but didn't Jesus say the poor you have with you always? Didn't Jesus say that? Yes, he did. So let's just do the best we can and, and just go on and try not to notice that gap. Let's put the kind of visors on blinders and just kind of go our way. And when we see people who don't have, when we see people who are poor, we just won't look their way. Because we'll just look down at the steps we're taking and I won't notice the people to my left or to my right and I'll go on with my life doing the best I can do. What would Jesus do? WWJD, what would Jesus do? We're asked that a lot. It's a common phrase. Did Jesus talk about this? Would Jesus be a capitalist? Would he be a socialist? Some say, yeah, he'd be one of the two. Or would he be indifferent? You know what? Jesus would reject all three. Jesus has a better solution. And it involves his church. It involves his people. And it comes throughout the Gospel of Luke, through the parables we've been studying in the past weeks, and especially the one we're going to look at today. Luke chapter 16 beginning at verse 19. Please stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. Let's hear what Jesus has to say about this gap between the rich and the poor and how His church, His people should respond. Luke chapter 16, beginning at verse 19. Jesus said, There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember, that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, 
I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Lord Jesus, every word that we have read has come from your lips. You taught this parable some 2,000 years ago to a Jewish audience. We know there's some cultural time bridges we need to cross. For Lord, we need to understand how the Jews thought. And some cultural references, Lord, I help, I pray that you would help me to rightly divide these and reveal these things to your people. I pray, Lord, that your people would hear the heart of the message. For we need to know. We need to be aware that we have to cross a gap that the rich man did not cross. Lord, please have mercy upon us. For none of us want to be like this rich man we know. Lord, thank you for your truth. And now sanctify us, we pray. In your holy name, Lord Jesus, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. Getting across the gulf, the gulf, the gap that is mentioned in this parable, it exists. And the rich man, he wasn't able to get across that gulf. In eternity, but what got him there was he was unable to cross the gulf in life, which is going to be a third point of the message. But let's get started with the first. You see the gulf on earth. Feel that in the outline. You see the gulf on earth between the rich man and Lazarus. Look at verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen. Fine linen was snow white clothes. And anybody that come out in fine linen, not just regular wool, but fine linen was a wealthy person. But if they had an outer garment of purple, Purple. The dye was so expensive, outrageously expensive to get a purple garment. If they come out in purple, they were the wealthiest of the wealthy. So this man was clothed in purple and fine linen. And he fared sumptuously every day. Remember the parable of the prodigal son. The father had the fatted calf killed, right? And threw a big party for like maybe over a hundred people They were faring sumptuously for a special occasion. This rich man lived this way every day of his life. He fared sumptuously. I guess if we had to see him, picture him in today's time in American culture, he would be driving, I don't know, a Bentley? Is that still a nice luxury car? Yeah, a performance car. He'd be driving a Bentley. He wouldn't buy suits from J.C. Penney. Oh, no. Custom made, $10,000 suits, $1,000 shoes. He wouldn't dare eat at Logan's or Cracker Barrel. No, that's commoners' places of dining. He would eat at the finest restaurants for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. $200 per plate food. That's what he would eat every day. He had it the best anybody could have it. And then there was Lazarus. Verse 20, he was a beggar. And indeed, he's the only person in the parables of Jesus that's named. His name means God helps. God helps. Lazarus was a certain beggar. And look at verse 20, he was full of sores. All over skin. Kind of like Job had boils, sores. Painful boils and sores all over his skin. You can bet he hadn't bathed in years. He stunk. People could 
expel him for 20 yards away. And look at this in verse 20. He was laid at the rich man's gate. What does that tell you? He was crippled. He couldn't walk. He had to have people pick him up, and they had to hold their breath and, and try not to get around any of his sores or touch his sores as they picked him up and put him by the gate of the rich man, hoping the rich man would have some pity on him. Kind of left him there. And Jesus said in verse 21 that he was so hungry, he desired to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. We think, okay, that's just the crumbs left over from where the rich man fared so sumptuously, you know, and chomped down on his bread and had pieces of bread laying on his table, and he, he desired to be... No, it's worse than that. It's worse than that. See, in, in Jewish culture, if you live sumptuously, what did you eat? Meat. And meat can often be what? Greasy and messy, and you eat it with your hands. You know what? Instead of linen napkins, you know what wealthy people had beside their plate? Loaves of bread, flat loaves of bread. And you know what they would do to clean their hands? They wouldn't use napkins like we do. You know what they would do? Rub their hands on that bread, clean their hands. You know what would fall? Crumbs. Yeah, it was worse than what we think. The crumbs from the rich man's table. Lazarus was so hungry he wanted to eat those crumbs that the rich man had used as a napkin. That's how hungry he was. And moreover, Jesus said, verse 21, the dogs came and licked his sores. Not the friendly family pets that we've all come to know and love. You know, when I was a kid, I don't believe this now, but I actually did up until I was probably in my early 20s. Somebody told me one time when I was about six or seven years old and I'd skint my knee real bad, falling in the driveway, you know, that, that if I would let my dog Lick that wound, it would heal faster. So if you're shaking your head, yeah, I heard that too. You know what, I believe that. Now we know that's really not true at all, okay? But these were not the same family pets, the dogs that we know and love. These were wild dogs, kind of dogs that just kind of roamed the streets looking for anything and everything, feral dogs that could be very, very dangerous. And these dogs came and licked Lazarus' sores adding to, not helping, but adding to his misery. And you can bet it took every strength, all the strength that he had left to fight those dogs off. That's how bad it was with Lazarus. So Lazarus, he couldn't have lived any worse. And he was just laid down at the rich man's gate. Notice that what? That gulf, that gap that existed between the rich man behind the gate and Lazarus right outside of his gate. There was that gulf between them. That gulf between them. But death, death is the great equalizer. Look in verse 22. So it was that the beggar died, and he was carried by the angels, where? To Abraham's bosom. No, no talk about what happened to his body. You know why? He wasn't buried. Jesus didn't talk about it. He wasn't buried. In Jewish culture, that was a great, horrible thing. Why can we conclude if the dogs licked his sores? There's a very strong possibility the dogs could have indeed eaten his body. Nobody wanted to bury him. But Jesus notes the rich man also died, and he was buried. I bet it was a grand funeral. Oh, no expense spared. Hired mourners, perhaps a dozen of them, crying and and weeping and mourning this man's loss. It was a grand funeral, no expense to spare. But, in verse 23, we find that things are going to be flipped a little bit. Point number two, you see the gulf in eternity with the rich man and Lazarus. There was a gulf in eternity. Things were flipped around. In eternity, the roles are indeed reversed. Verse 23 he being in torments, not torment, but torments. Multitude of torments in Hades, the place of the dead, the abode of the dead. He lifted up his eyes, and you know what he saw? He saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Now you may have heard that all your life and wondered, what in the world does that mean? I mean, I, I can't imagine that. What, what's, what's Jesus talking about here? Abraham and, and Lazarus was in his bosom. What does that mean? In Jewish culture, they didn't eat around a table 
sitting down in chairs like we do. They ate basically laying down. The table is only probably about maybe a foot and a half off the floor. And they would have big, large pillows for comfort laying around. And, and, and Jews would lay down and prop themselves up on their elbows and they would eat, kind of supported by the pillows and one another around the table. And their feet would be out behind them. So you know what? After, oftentimes after they would eat and they had their fill, they would just kind of lean up and talk to one another. It was a time of fellowship. You know, lean and talk to one another and converse. And that's what we see in the Last Supper there with John. When he leaned upon Jesus' breast, what you see is John just kind of leaned over and talked to Jesus. So this is a time of fellowship. When it says Lazarus was in the bosom of Abraham, if they were around the table fellowshipping together, enjoying a meal and enjoying the love that they had for one another and for God. And the rich man, verse 24, he cries out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And please send Lazarus, he didn't say please, he said, send Lazarus that he may even dip the tip of his finger in water just to cool my tongue, for I am so tormented in this flame. Well, what did Abraham say to him? Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. So in other words, the rich man desired mercy, but mercy would never come. Mercy would never come. Did Lazarus desire mercy on this earth when he was laid at the rich man's gate? Did he desire the crumbs that fell from the rich man's napkin? Yes. Did Lazarus receive any mercy? No. This rich man would not receive mercy ever. Lazarus was comforted in eternity when he died. This rich man would be tormented for all eternity when he died. So, how can we conclude verses 26 to verse 26? What, what conclusions can we come from this? You know what? If, if Jesus stopped talking at verse 26 and that was it, you know what logically we can conclude? We can conclude we're all in trouble. We're all in trouble. That's what we can conclude. Because we can conclude what? That if you're rich, if you're rich, and you don't give away all your riches and basically share with other people, and become like Lazarus, poor and tormented, then you're going to wind up in Hades like the rich man in a place of torments. And in order to get to the place of heaven, the place of paradise, what? You need to become like Lazarus and just become a poor beggar. If Jesus would have stopped in verse 26, we could say, well, I guess that's a logical conclusion. I better make a radical life change in how I live. And by the way, we'd all be in trouble, wouldn't we? But thankfully, the Lord Jesus Christ did not stop there. Thankfully, we have verses 27 to 31. Because there was a gulf the rich man did not get over or cross over on this earth that we had better. Listen to me, church. There was a gulf that the rich man never crossed while he was on this earth, but we had better cross it. Okay? What is it? Third point. The gulf of earnestness. The gulf of earnestness. You say, Pastor, where are you going with this? Did you just say earnestness because it starts with an E? No, I have a purpose for it. Right out beside earnestness. Earnestness means showing serious intent. If you are earnest about something, you show serious intent to do it. You do. And the rich man was not earnest in listening and obeying and applying the truth of God's Word. He wasn't. Had he really changed? Look, if you will, in verses 24, 27, and 28. Look at his attitude in verse 24. Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus, that he may dip his tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented. In other words, send that beggar Lazarus to do my bidding, Father Abraham. Send him over. And then, if you will, look at verse 27. I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send them to my Father's house. Send Lazarus back to my Father's house, to people who are like me, my five brothers. Send them there. 
making these demands to Abraham. And then he argues with him in verse 30, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. In other words, telling Abraham, you know, this is what you need to do, this is what you better do, send Lazarus. His attitude hadn't changed a whole lot, had he? How did he get there anyways? Look at verse 30, there's one word I want you to focus on, repent. Repentance. Was there any repentance in the rich man's life? Obviously not, because he said, my five brothers need to repent, lest they come to this place of torments like me. There was no repentance in his life. So what did he need to repent from? He needed to repent from not obeying and putting into practice God's word as taught in Moses and the prophets. Because that's what Abraham said to him, wasn't it? He said, they have Moses, they have the prophets, let your five brothers hear them. They should listen. They should be earnest when they hear. Have you ever thought about this? Do you think the rich man went to synagogue every Sabbath? I'm sure he did. He was a wealthy Jewish man in society. I'm sure he went to, to synagogue every Sabbath day. And I'm sure he sat down in a very, very prestigious place. And I'm sure he heard the rabbis exhort the Word of God and teach the Word of God from the Old Testament. He heard it. He heard it. But did he do it? Did he do it? Obviously not. There's no repentance. What, what, what did he need to hear? What did he need to do? Oh, it's full. The Old Testament's full of, of passages. But I just want to take you to. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 15. This is what the rich man heard that he didn't apply. He wasn't earnest about. Deuteronomy chapter 15, beginning at verse 7. Deuteronomy 15, beginning at verse 7. Look what God said through Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 7. And by the way, by the way, don't listen to people who say, I'm a New Testament Christian. I don't believe in that Old Testament stuff. That Old Testament stuff don't apply today. I'm a New Testament Christian. You know what? That's a bunch of baloney. It's hogwash and it's blasphemous. All the Word of God applies to us. Some say, I'm a red-letter Christian. You know what that is? That's the person who says, only the words written in red in the New Testament, the words of Jesus, do I see as authoritative in my life. Everything else I just kind of, I don't adhere to it. I'm a red-letter Christian. Bunch of baloney too. All Scripture, all Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable to God's people, including the Old Testament. Look what God said in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 7. If there is among you a poor man of your brethren within any of the gates in your land, did you hear that? Within any of the gates. Where was Lazarus laid? The rich man's gate. Within any of the gates in your land which the Lord your God has given you, you shall not harden your heart nor shut your hand from your poor brother. But you shall open your hand wide to him and willingly lend him sufficient for his need, whatever he needs. Beware. Beware. Lest there be a wicked thought in your heart saying, The seventh year, the year of release, is at hand, and your eye be evil against your poor brother, and you give him nothing. And he cry out to the Lord against you, and it becomes sin among you. God said, beware. You shall surely give to him, and your heart should not be grieved when you give to him, because for this thing the Lord your God will bless you in all your works and in all to which you put your hand, for the poor will never cease from the land. Therefore I command you, saying, you shall open your hand wide to your brother, to your poor and your needy, in your land. What did God say in verse 11? The poor will never cease from the land. Is capitalism going to solve the gap, the gulf between rich and poor? Is socialism going to solve the gulf between the rich and the poor? Is being indifferent 
and apathetic as God's people. Is that going to solve the gulf? Is that going to close the gulf between the rich and the poor? No. Do you hear what God is asking us to do? Do you see what the rich man did not do? And why he ended up in Hades? He heard this. Undoubtedly he heard it. He probably heard it a bunch of times. But he never applied it. He never did it. And that's the reason that he was in torment in Hades, crying out, send Lazarus, just, just have him tip, dip the tip of his finger in water and put it on my tongue to cool it. I'm, I'm so tormented in this flame. He had no earnest, no earnestness at all in his heart to obey and to apply the word of God. I pray it's different with us. I pray it's different with us. Because look at Micah chapter 6, talking about the prophets, Micah chapter 6. That's in my, well, he's one of the minor prophets, by the way. So if you turn to Matthew and kind of go back, Malachi, Zechariah, Zephaniah, Nahum, you'll find Micah chapter 6. He's kind of in the middle of the minor prophets. Micah chapter 6, verse 8. This is what God has shown us. New Covenant Christians, yes. But this is what He has shown us in His Old Covenant. Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good. He's shown you what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. This is what the Lord requires of His people. And some say, well, are we supposed to obey, obey the ceremonial laws of the Old Testament? No, the ceremonial laws we are free from, but God's moral law, God's moral laws are still applicable to us. It's the moral authority of the Old Testament. We can't just throw that away. We can't. Because remember what we learned a few weeks ago in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Please turn to Luke chapter 10. Remember what Jesus said? When the lawyer questioned him in Luke chapter 10, Behold, a certain lawyer, verse 25, stood up and tested him. And he said, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Oh, that's a good question. What do I have to do to live forever in eternity with God? What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? I would think Jesus would have said, Believe in me. Remember, a couple weeks ago when we, I preached on this, I don't think he'd have quoted John 3, 16. Right? Believe in me. But Jesus didn't do that, did he? Look what he told the lawyer in verse 26. He said to him, what is written in the law? What's written in the law? Well, what, what's your reading of it? So the lawyer answered this, this expert in the Old Testament law. He answered right, didn't he? Oh, yes, he was perfect. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Look what Jesus said in verse 28. And he said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. Oh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Is, is Jesus here saying it's a works-based salvation? you got to work at it. No. What Jesus is saying, if you do love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, you know what? You're going to love your neighbor as yourself. You're not going to ignore Lazarus who's laid at your gate. You're not going to just walk by him like he doesn't even exist. No. Not if you truly know God. Not if you truly have faith. Not if you truly believe. You're not going to ignore your neighbor. You're not going to ignore your fellow human being. No, you're going to see them for who they are. A man or a woman made in God's image that God loves and that Jesus died for. That's how you're going to see them. And this is in the New Testament as well. Turn, if you will, to the book of James, chapter 2. Look what the Bible says in the New Testament, book of James, chapter 2. Some would say, well, the Old Testament, you know, that applies, some would even falsely say, oh, that's just, you know, commandments to Israel, to the nation. Okay, 
I don't believe that. You shouldn't believe that either. But let's concede that, if you will, just for the sake of argument. Look what the New Testament says. James chapter 2, verse 14. James 2, 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Hmm. Can faith save him? James 2, 14. Can faith save him? Well, what does it profit if someone says... If he says, I got faith, but they don't have any works to go with it, can faith save them? Look at verse 15, answering the question. Hey, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and be filled, but you you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what is the problem? You see how he answers the question in verse 14? He answers it in verses 15 and 16. Does that make any sense? No. Now look at verse 17. Thus also. Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. A little bit of bonus for you. Look at verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe that, and they tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? We are not saved by our works. We are saved by our faith. But if we truly have faith, it will come out in our works. That's what the Bible clearly teaches. That's what Jesus is teaching in this parable. Now look at 1 John chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. 1 John chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Look what the Bible says about how this practically works out. 1 John 3, 17. But whoever has this world's goods, like that rich man, and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? A good question. Whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Let's love in deed and in truth. Let's show our faith by our works. So what's the teaching point of this parable? What what? What do we have to take away from this? Listen closely. We cannot be like the rich man who cared only for his own kind. His brothers, his five brothers and people like them. We cannot be like him who did not see Lazarus until it was too late. Oh, the rich man, he knew Lazarus' name, didn't he? He knew his name. But he never saw him. He never saw him as a person. He never saw him as somebody who God loved. He never saw him as a child of God, made in the image of God. He never saw him as his brother. He saw him as what? quite frankly, a stinking pile of refuse by his gate laying there that he just assumed he'd go away. The rich man probably was looking forward to the day that Lazarus would die and be gone because it bothered him taking a glance at him every now and then. It bothered the smell of him, I'm sure bothered him. We cannot be like this rich man because the ability to see, to see through God's eyes is the mark of a true disciple. Let me say that again. The ability to see people like God sees people through his eyes is the mark of a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Let's not have any of this, well, let's share the gospel with people but forget about their physical needs. Because we Southern Baptists, I was talking about this in Sunday school. We Southern Baptists sometimes, we, we, we want to push back against what's called the social gospel. 
where we just meet people's physical needs, you know, and, and we criticize other denominations. Well, you meet their physical needs and, and you do good for them and you help the poor and you do this and you do that, but you don't ever share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. You don't ever witness to them. Okay. Do we need to witness to people? Yeah. But what did James say? What good does it do if you witness and you share the gospel and the love of Christ with them, but then they're destitute of food, they're destitute of clothing, and you say, well, I hope you're warm, I hope you're clothed, believe in Jesus anyways, goodbye. That doesn't make any sense, does it? Hey, Jesus blows that all to pieces through the gospel of Luke, especially in this parable. A gospel, good news, that does not meet people's physical needs and have pity upon the poor and the outcast is not the true gospel of Christ. Did you hear that, church? It's not. It's not the true gospel of Christ. Just meeting people's physical needs and, and just being kind of the poor and never ever speaking a word. Shh, don't say anything that will offend them. That's not the true gospel of Christ either. It's a balance. It's a balance. You meet people's physical needs and then you share the gospel with them. That's what Jesus here is saying. That's what he is that's what he's teaching us. That's what he's saying. So in closing, who is the Lord laid at your gate? Who's at your gate? Who's the Lazarus at your gate? Is it that person holding the cardboard sign as you go to work every morning? that you don't look at? Maybe. Preacher, should I give to them? Preacher, you know people take advantage. Preacher, you know. You know, don't you? Some of them are scam artists. Maybe why don't you investigate and possibly give to organizations that help get those people off the streets? like the rescue mission in Roanoke. Why don't you do that? Why don't you go a little bit deeper into the problem? Preacher, I really don't know of anybody like Lazarus in America. Maybe not. But you know what? Technology and the way the world is today, it shrunk our world. And there are many Christians in third world countries who are very close to li living like Lazarus. How are you going to explain to God, well, they were a long ways away, Lord. I couldn't help them. Oh, really? God would say, really? You didn't know about them? You couldn't help them through all these relief organizations that my people started around the world? You couldn't help them, really? Who's at your gate? Because technology has made the world a lot smaller than it used to be. Basically, we can say what? The whole world. The whole world is at our gate. May God grant us mercy. All of us, me included. May he grant us mercy. May he grant us insight to see Lazarus to see Lazarus before it's too late. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the words of your Son, Jesus Christ, who you have ordained as a prophet indeed to the nations. A prophet that is still speaking your truth to people today, that's spoken to us today. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being the mouthpiece of your Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for speaking to your people. I could not speak into their lives, but you did. You know where they're at. You know. And you are right now working in their hearts. Holy Spirit, please show us, reveal to us who, who's at our gate. 
Oh, for the gulf between the rich and the poor, the haves and the have-nots, it may be large, but you know who can reduce it? You can through your people. One kind act at a time. One act of obedience at a time will shrink that gap. Nothing else is going to. You've given us the privilege of doing that. If we're earnest about it, if we really believe your word and your truth, and we really believe it, we'll practice it. We'll be doers of the word. Lord God, I just want to take a moment before we stand and sing our song for you to speak clearly to your people. Christ Jesus.